Well, good evening. It's so encouraging to see such a great crowd out here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. My name's Lenny Anderson. I'm the president of the Clinton Township Historical Society, otherwise known as Amelia Earhart. I thought it was appropriate tonight. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I also want to thank you for stopping by, any of you who stopped by our historical village this summer. We had a pretty active summer. We had a few open houses in July during a, a concert season and a couple other dates. We also just were open a couple of weeks ago for Festival of the Senses. If you happen to stop by, we had a number of crafts and activities for the kids then. It was a lot of fun. Um, we have some ambitious plans to grow our village and to share more of the history with the community and the children. And so we welcome, if you aren't a member of our society, please feel free to join us. We have membership forms over here. You can sign up. Um, we also have two vacancies coming up on our Board of Trustees. So if you'd like to maybe contribute your talents, I see a raised hand, I might recruit you. <laughs> and if you want to help guide the direction of where the society is going, please speak with one of us tonight so we can add your name to the ballot. The election will be at next month's meeting on November 16th, right here in the auditorium. In fact, all of you who join the society tonight will be eligible to vote. So think about that. Uh, well, I thought it would be particularly apropos today uh, to have our speaker tonight because today, of course, being Columbus Day. So for the adventurous in all of us and the explorer in all of us, I am proud to welcome our author of book, Roseville Airport, tonight. Gail Elliott is a member of the Roseville Historical Society and a retired medical technologist from Beaumont Hospital. Now, after living on the grounds of the former airfield of what is now Eastgate Center, Gail started researching the history of this important missing link. She uncovered such a wealth of information, she finally compiled it all into a book and published it about a year ago in time for Roseville's 50th anniversary celebration. Gail shares her interest in aviation with her husband, Bill, a pilot and former Air Force airman, as well as their sons, James, Thomas, and Robert. So without further ado, let's get started. Let's welcome Gail Elliott. discovered why that was on there yet because Packard started it in 1919 so there still might be something maybe maybe the flyers from Selfridge were touching down there or something back in 1914 so we're really not sure what the significance of that 1914 was too bad somebody didn't write it down and sign their name to it And this is where the airport is. You can see 696 at the top, the Gratiot, and then the red is Valmy. Uh, it goes along Friesel and Marquette and Roseville and Brown. 
Okay, this is the one of the Packard board meeting minutes where they authorized, uh, ratified, and approved leasing the property from the Templetons and for a year and with the intention of purchasing it. Came across somebody who actually has all the board meeting minutes for Packard. This is from an old map. You can see A.J. Templeton's property. Moldenhauer lives just, he was just off to the west from the airport. And our fence was between Mr. Moldenhauer and, and he used to come over the fence and talk to us about the airport. That's when I first knew about it. But it took me quite a few years before I did anything with it. <coughs> That's Frazel right there? Frazel's right here. Yes, right. And this is a picture of um, of the first of first and only Packard airplane. Uh, this was Jesse Vincent on the left. He was the chief engineer uh, for uh, Packard Motor Car Company, and the other man was their pilot, their test pilot. And uh, uh, they uh, developed this plane in 1919 when Packard announced that they were going to produce a passenger, two passenger biplane to sell for about $15,000. Uh, Vincent patented the design and filed the application in February 7, 1920. After this first plane was built, Packard decided they didn't want to produce airplanes. So uh, the plane was then left for Vincent to use and to test components, like carburetors and things on the uh, engine. The airplane was then sold in 1925, and after which it was modified a number of times and changed uh, ownership several times. And it came back to Packard Field in uh, 1934. Uh, now it was owned by Art John, the man pictured in, in the picture. The boy is his son, Art Jr. And uh, he lived in a big white house across Gratiot. It's now part of Bueller Funeral Home. Uh, in 1926, Mr. John was a, one of the first council members of the village of Roseville. He told his grandson that Wiley Post had flown with him in that airplane, and the family still has a propeller from it. Uh, the last owner of the airplane was Howard Hatson Bueller of Mount Clemens. On October 5th, 1936, the license expired, and nobody knows what happened to the plane after that. The grandchildren thought it was it had become part of a sign. That was as much as they knew. So it's too bad it disappeared because it was the only one that Packard built. That was a Packard plane. They built other planes for other people during World War One, but that was be quite an item to have now. Uh, now this is Packard hangar number one. Uh, there's three planes in front of it. Uh, I found that somebody had identified them as a boat. Uh, and the second one's a Curtis JN4, and the third one back is a USDA 9P45. There were a lot of planes built back in a lot of different designations. So this, um, the hangars are about where Kroger is now at Eastgate Shopping Center. Um, let's just think about that one. Right in 1922, uh, they had the National Air Races and the Pulitzer Race from Salford Air Force Base. And events two, three, and four started at Salford and they uh, came around the pylon at, at Packard Field over here and went down to Vacro Point and went back to Southridge. And then they had the Pulitzer Race that went from Southridge, Southridge to Vacro Point to a ship out there. 
the USS Dubuque and back to Salford, then we were on five times. So it was kind of interesting to find that little chart. The man in the front of this picture appears to be um, William B. Stout, and he was a, a, an inventor. He had just invented a lot of things, planes and RVs and cars, and just, I read a book written by him, and he, he really sounded like he was just going from one thing to another. He was Packard's chief engineer, aeronautical engineer, from December 1916 to August 1917. He founded the Stout All-Metal Airplane Company in 1923, and then that was purchased by Ford in 1925. He uh, developed a trimotor that was a forerunner of the Ford trimotor. The plane in the picture appears to be a herd. Uh, we figured that one out by description that we found in Aviation Magazine from 1928. The herd lock and chain which is still around, uh, was going to build this airplane, but apparently it must have just, just uh, ended with that. It was kind of an interesting airplane in that it was a low wing at the time. This is one of Stout's airplanes. He described it in this book. It's a stout bat wing commercial airplane of 1920. It was plywood covered. The first flight was at Packard Field, piloted by Ben Bert Acosta, a leading test pilot. It has a 36 foot wingspan. On takeoff, it lost one of its wheels. So on landing, it went gently over onto its back. <laughs> and the pilot climbed out unhurt. Minimal damage and it was repaired in the air a few days. And this one is um, oh, this is Ed Extenson's Detroiter. It was first public we demonstrated at Packard Field on February 21st, 1926. A foot of snow was on the ground. It, uh, it was a biplane with 200 horsepower right radial motor, seats four people. It gains a speed of 125 miles per hour. The glass enclosed cabin had non shattering glass, which was a new thing at the time. It had exhaust heating in the cabin. It had brakes on each landing gear. And it was a self-starter. So the pilot now could start it himself with us some help. And that day, because of the snow, they put tire chains on it. So they could stop it. You can't see them very good in the picture, but I saw another picture taken just of the landing gear. You could really see it. Hard to pick it out on that one. The Roseville Record of May 20, 1926, and I had an article about Roseville Chamber of Commerce sponsored a meeting to discuss securing the Stinson Detroiter airplane factory for Roseville. The next article we saw in the bottom was uh, November 23, 1927. There was a commerce meeting, and a brother of Ed Stinson wanted to uh, attain Packer Field. The Stinsons came from Texas. Um, they actually owned an airfield down there. And Eddie Stinson had two sisters that were older than him, and they were both pilots. And he wanted them to teach him to fly, and they told him no, because he'd kill himself. <laughs> he did eventually die in an airplane accident. <laughs> 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 September 27, 1928, there was a headline that Stinson Corporation may move here. 
the Roseville Chamber of Commerce had two sites to offer for an airplane factory. And then there was nothing again for several months. May 29, 1929, page six, Roseville Record. This article appeared. Stinson Aircraft Corporation had just moved into a new 10-acre aircraft factory at Wayne Detroit Airport, which is now Metro. So, Roseville lost out. Packard Motor Car Company Board Meeting, December 22, 1926. The authorized management to obtain bids on the sale of Packard Aviation Field property. Packard had built a proving grounds out in Shelby Township. You probably know where that is. And they'd also put in a um, little field in the middle of a test strip, so, uh, another track. So they had a place to test planes out there and they didn't need Roseville's Packard Field anymore. So the new, Newberry Estate was the new owner. And it was formed by Truman and Harriet Newberry and John and Edith Newberry. The Newberry brothers were brothers of uh, Mrs. Henry B. Joy, who was the president of Packard Motor Car Company. <laughs> On September 21, 1927, the Roseville Record reported Curtis Wright Company took a two-year lease to the airport. Curtis Wright was not today's Curtis Wright Corporation. Curtis Wright was the name of a man that had a company. And that was before Curtis Wright Corporation, so he wasn't even trying to cash in on it. Um, the company only lasted a few months, though, so about six months. February 1928, they were having financial difficulties, so. The next tenant was Michigan State Aviation School and Packard Flying Service. Packard Flying Service occupied the Quonset kind of building <coughs> in the back and Michigan State Aviation School's in the front. H.C. Harkon was co-owner of Packard Flying Service. Michigan State Aviation School seems to have lasted about a year. Hartung Aircraft Corporation then incorporated January 30th, 1929. And this is one of the uh, mechanics um, that patches to the back of their coveralls. They offered flight instruction, mechanic training, and aircraft repair. Mechanic training was offered until 1943, and then, then it was stopped because of World War II and then it resumed again after the war. Well, this is Howard and Gladys Hartung on their wedding day. Howard and Gladys Hartung met on a ship on the way to Paris. Uh, she was from Racine, Wisconsin, and she was uh, with a drum corps for the Racine American Legion, post number 76. Well, after they came back to the state, she quit her job in Racine, and she came over to the Detroit area and learned to fly. And two years later, they got married over the Racine airport. She threw her bouquet out over the airport. She said it was his idea. <laughs> This is Gladys in her um, <coughs> airplane. So, it's a Brunner Winkle Bird, 1929. Seems to be a pretty popular plane now. We've got a little orange here. Right? <laughs> the Hartons had two children. There was uh, Ron, and he was the younger one. 
enjoy. Yeah. yeah. So they did a lot of promotion with Joyce. They had a lot of cute little outfits, and they'd have her in ads. And I thought she was going to be a great pilot when she grew up. When she grew up, she hated aircraft. <laughs> <laughs> that, was a real, was that a real parachute? That was a real parachute. And she didn't like it. Yeah. It was heavy. I've seen it. I, I met her husband when I was researching. He's got it. And it's got a heavy canvas cover, and the parachute itself is far heavier material than it is now. And she wasn't even two years old then, so it's probably pulling her right over backwards. <laughs> she had her first flight when she was 20 days old. They took her up for 20 minutes. <laughs> and it made the newspaper of birth. <laughs> Again, another picture of her. This is this man in this picture tested that parachute. He's Jan Bergen, National Guardsman, first sergeant. And it was an air meet at the field on May 1933. He took the, the little parachute and put a doll on it. And they took him up to 2,000 feet. And he jumped out and pulled the cord on that parachute and let go of it. He, they were free fall for a little ways and then opened his chute so that he landed on the ground first and then he caught the doll. Luckily her parents never had to try it. <laughs> okay, this is a pose picture of course. All kinds of stuff came up. <laughs> oh, we missed the picture. Well, that's okay. I don't have anything to say about it. It's just... I probably was going to turn it back. Okay. This was an air show on Sunday, October 29, 1933. And I like this picture. Look at all the cars. There. This is graphic. You can see all the tires parked between them. You're not on the field. <laughs> all the way to the end. That's, this is crazy. So, what would be the extent of the escape? Of the How far would you see? Oh, it, it probably it probably goes about the road of their kind of that. The rest of the tall houses and apartments. Because we lived on Finders in the apartment, right behind it. I'm going to take this picture and walk down Fraser and see if I can get kind of houses. There is one that was there. They were pretty civic minded there is a, a baseball field here. And there's a football field there somewhere. Where's the run? Well, they were in the market. They just ran away. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not paid. It's just yeah. soft. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I know somebody whose father was one of the presidents of the village of Roseville. They used to have this uh, rose parade every year, I guess. And they'd have this carnival and stuff on the airport. And one year she said it was raining and hardly anybody was coming. And they were getting concerned they weren't going to make anything. So he and his buddies took a whole bunch of tires out on the field and left. And this big bonfire going, well, you know how much smoke comes off of tires, it drew a crowd. <laughs> so, so apparently the festival was pretty successful. <laughs> Couldn't do that now. They can do the pile of tires. <laughs> Wouldn't be good. Um, this is Mabel Breton who received the Bergman Trophy for Major Howard. Rocked it at the airport. They had the Women's Air Meet of 1934. Let's look at that one. Um, she flew away from. There was bomb dropping contests and spot landing. The bomb dropping, of course, was a, a bag of flour dropped at a spot on the ground and spot landing. Mr. Ruff was head of the Michigan Bureau of Air Commerce. And it's the same. Yeah. She, that's a silver platter. It's a prize. There's some pretty nice prizes. This is Martha Devereaux. Uh, this was the same uh, kind. 
Well, actually, a picture one. But at the same time, Martha Deverell won the student decision landing contest. This picture was taken two years later, holding her son. Her husband, John, was the last manager of Roseville Airport. His name was John Huddleston. Later, Martha was the manager of Great Community Airport for a few years. Now this, this is the Joyce Hartung Trophy. It was established by Howard Hartung in, in his daughter Joyce's name. It was awarded to a woman pilot each year from 1936 to 1943. Joyce's husband has a trophy, yes. Yeah. <laughs> It would be nice if you donate the trophy and the parachute to us. <laughs> I guess his daughter wants it. Kind of neat to see it. No surprises. Do you have a museum? No, we don't. We <laughs> just store stuff. <laughs> and this is, um, these are the women who were going to compete for the first year for the trophy. October 1936. Uh, left to right, we have Dorothy Healy, Mary Von Mack, Lenore Grabowski, Alice Hirschman, Helen Ledio, Leela Baker, and Mrs. Hartung. And in the plane is Joyce. Uh, the second woman from the left, Mary Von Mack, was the first woman in Michigan who held a pilot's license. She was also the first one who owned an airplane. And after she accomplished that, she went to St. Louis, Missouri, and, and got her uh, mechanics license from the school out there. She was quite a woman. <laughs> now this is the lady that won the first one. Uh, she was uh, Dorothy Carpenter. And she was uh, earning her doctorate in botany at U of M. She had time to fly an airplane. The man standing in the background was um, John Hammond. He was a radio announcer. And the man in the front, on the right hand side, is Robert Evans, chairman of the Aeronautical Activities Association. The second year, we had Doris Lowry. She flew an Aronka flipper, and in her hand was a balloon for the balloon popping contest. And they went up and dropped the balloon out, out of the window and broke it with a propeller. through a lot of newspapers to find everybody. <laughs> and this one is <laughs> Helen Montgomery being presented the trophy by George Hartung. She won it in 1939. Wyatt lived in Lansing, right, right near the airport. She was fascinated with aircraft. She used to cut out everything she could find in the newspaper about airplanes and put them in scrapbooks, which is in a museum over Lansing now. All the stuff we collected. Her dad forbid her to go over the airport. Of course, she wasn't successful. And her mother kind of supported her, so she and her mother ended up putting in a uh, refreshment stand at the airport in order to pay for her flying. Okay. 
1841. This was Bay Kirk was the winner. Uh, she's the